But it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Shari Diamond. Professor Diamond is the Howard J. Trainins Professor of Law in the Law School here at Northwestern. Dr. Diamond received her JD from the University of Chicago Law School and her PhD in social psychology from here at Northwestern. She's among the leading scholars in the world studying the jury process and legal decision making. She was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2012, and her scholarship continues to be highly influential in the development of rules, the rules courts use during jury selection and jury instruction phases. In addition to her scholarship, Professor Diamond is active in policymaking, having helped to draft the principles for juries uh, uh, of jury trials, and she currently serves in the Seventh Circuit Committee on Pattern Criminal Jury Instructions. Today, Professor Diamond will present her work on fair juries. Please join me in welcoming Sherry Diamond. Thanks very much, John. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, when I was a graduate student at Northwestern, um, before uh, it was called IPR, um, I worked uh, at this very same uh, institution with great, with great pleasure um, and uh, worked on an, a case called the Contract Buyers League case uh, involving contract sales on the south and west side uh, to, um, uh, to poor folks who uh, were kind of taken in. Um, so it was a great experience. And I'm sure that uh, everybody who has contact with IPR uh, has the, exactly the same history when they leave, uh, when they leave Northwest. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, delighted to uh, talk to you about a project that it came about in a sort of strange way. Um, it is, it, it's not sort of a typical project that I would talk about as a research uh, project. Um, but what happened was um, uh, there were, as you may know, a number of recent trials, um, high profile trials in which the public kind of held its breath to see what the jury was going to do in the trial. There was concern about um, uh, whether, how the jury would respond to these controversial cases. Uh, you may recall the one involving um, the police officer who was on trial uh, for the murder of uh, uh, George uh, uh, Floyd uh, and other cases uh, as well. Um, the Paul Manafort case where uh, uh, Trump's um, cohort was on trial for um, having um, uh, misused funds, shall we say, uh, and the uh, Rittenhouse case that came, took place almost next door um, uh, in uh, our neighboring state, uh, and the Aubrey case in uh, in uh, uh, Georgia. Uh, so all of these attracted a great deal of, 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 of attention. And um, uh, it was interesting to see the commentary as people held their breath waiting for the jury uh, to come back. And so, um, uh, I, I, and, and I also have been doing some research in um, uh, the fledgling jury systems in Argentina, where there is great enthusiasm for, uh, for, for the jury. Uh, and uh, if people are interested in it, I can talk about that in the Q&A, um, and have been working on jury uh, reforms. So my colleague, uh, uh, Valerie Hans at Cornell and I, uh, who have been studying juries for a very long time, um, decided we would put together um, a paper about what um, fair, fair juries represented. And it includes a good deal of information on um, the variety of places that juries um, uh, can uh, go wrong or need more help or have been succeeding over time. And um, I'll get, to, well, by the time I get to the end, I'll have some uh, uh, invitations for you to weigh in on some research that we are just starting to do uh, that has to do with, uh, with fair juries. I should say in the, uh, to begin with, that the jurors, I think, uh, acquitted themselves quite well in these high profile cases. So the uh, a breathing a, 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 
a sigh of relief is not out of order perhaps, but I wasn't surprised because of the jury studies that I've been doing uh, for a long time. But you'll see that there are ways to go to improve the system and I'll talk about those as well. So there's a, uh, there are a couple of views of the jury um, that are kind of competing images. Um, on the one hand, uh, incompetent and biased, um, easily uh, manipulated, naive, and on the other side, just a unique source of wisdom, a repository of common sense. Um, you know, those aren't quite exactly right about capturing how the jury actually behaves. And I had the opportunity to do some research on actual jury uh, uh, deliberations uh, in civil cases, in 50 civil cases in Arizona. And the picture that emerges from that research is a much more complicated kind of picture, but a very distinctive picture that characterizes the jury in a way that doesn't characterize students in a classroom, which the jury is sometimes compared to. We have to teach the jury things so it will be competent. What really characterizes the jury is it is a pragmatic group problem solver. And one of the great advantages of it being a group problem solver is that it can draw on each other's um, uh, abilities, backgrounds, experiences, unlike, uh, unlike a judge and a practical decision maker. It's not given everything that is known in the case. Certain pieces of information are excluded from it and it develops pragmatic strategies for dealing with the information it is given. So on the civil side, for example, the jury has called on, is called on to judge uh, pain and suffering. Well, there's no metric for pain and suffering, but it uses a reference point frequently, which is how much it was in medical expenses, just as a reference point, as a starting point for deciding um, how much should be for pain and suffering. I could give you other examples, but the other piece of the jury that is distinctive is that it is in an adversary context. And so unlike a classroom where the assumption is that the teacher is there um, to tell you um, something objective about the world, the jury goes into the courtroom and knows that the parties each have interests and access to grind. And most of the witnesses testifying on either side are in the same position. So they're aware that this is an adversary context and they use other kinds of decision-making methods in order to deal with the fact that it's an adversary context. So it's a very distinctive uh, organization uh, different from most other organizations. Uh, well, why have a jury? Okay. One reason to have a jury is because of the decision-making benefits of the group. And we talk about why have a jury, it's always in relation to the alternative, which is a judge. So the single judge may have less experience with the world, the wide world, um, and the an inability to draw on the group um, experiences that the jury has. We know from research on group decision making um, that in jury decision making that the more heterogeneous the jury is, um, the better decision making it engages in. So heterogeneity on the jury is a really important dimension. And that's one of the dimensions I'll talk about as I talk about fair juries. Um, also, it's a democracy enhancing body. That is people who experience jury service, generally speaking, come back feeling better about the um, legal system, feeling better about the jury, feeling um, uh, more empowered. And there's even some uh, research from John Gastille and his colleagues that shows that after jury service, after serving on a jury, you are more likely to vote 
you are more likely to participate um, civically. So it has this enhancing experience as well. It also has a legitimacy. We know from surveys that the jury is perceived as a more acceptable decision maker um, uh, than a judge. Uh, so there is an, advance, uh, an advantage um, there as well. Now, let's talk about pathways to fair juries. And I talk about this in terms of three stages. The first stage, which is hidden from view um, as we talk about um, juries and watch them um, in the newspaper, is obtaining a pool of prospective jurors that represents a fair cross-section of the community. If you don't start with a fair cross-section, then you aren't going to be able to build it along the way. Second, um, you want to preserve, to the extent that you can, representativeness, but all at the same time as maintaining fairness in the selection of the actual jury. And third, you have to support understanding and ameliorate uh, potential bias on the jury during the course of the trial. That's a tall order. That's a tall order. So how do we do it? Well, back in history, right, for a little while. The evolution of jury eligibility. Uh, at the time of the Magna Carta, long before the United States, who had the right to a jury? The peers, the peers, the noblemen. That's, they, that was the right that was gotten in the Magna Carta. By the time we get to the colonies, we have white male property owners who have the right to be on a jury and the right to have a jury trial. There's a lot missing from this little circle, right? Women are not there. Non-whites are not there. It took a long period of time for us to get to the point where women were guaranteed the right to equal service or the obligation, if you will, uh, as, as men and uh, for blacks to be permitted to serve on the jury. So now how is it expanded? Okay, we have now citizens who speak and understand English. So we've gotten an enlargement, yay. We've gotten a greater representation but what is missing here? One big group are folks who have a felony conviction. A majority of states exclude them from jury service. The majority of states exclude them from voting and then from jury service. Um, and that's over 19 million felons and ex-felons, 8% of the adult population. It's a lot of people. And it's not random. So that a third of black adult males uh, have a felony record. What does that mean for the jury? Well, there was a nice study done in Georgia um, that showed that it reduced this exclusion, reduced the pool of eligible African-American by nearly one third, by nearly one third. That's a lot. Is this wholesale exclusion warranted? Well, there's this balance between representativeness and bias. Some really interesting research just done, um, a, a series of studies done by James Bennell um, uh, showing that there is very little difference between felons who serve on juries and law students in terms of their reactions to cases. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a book called uh, 20 Million Angry Men um, that James wrote, uh, so I recommend it to you. 
So uh, is wholesale exclusion warranted? Probably not. There is a movement beginning in the country to expand uh, jury service to include these folks um, or to shorten the period of exclusion. Uh, the District of Columbia just shortened it from 10 years to one year. Um, so there is some movement in that direction for expansion toward fair juries. But there's also slippage in representativeness um, in jury pools at the operational level. So um, source lists uh, initially were all voter registration lists. There has been some expansion, so most states supplement them with voter registration lists and with, with a, a driver's uh, 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 license registration and also with um, uh, ID registrations. But the problem with some of those is that they are not updated. Um, they are not updated frequently. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Stale source lists, if they are not updated um, regularly, then when you send a summons, it gets returned and it's not up to date. So you don't get um, information. This is not, again, random, okay? This is not a random loss. Lack of follow-up. People tend to ignore summons. Uh, it is not an efficient system. No follow-up means you get a great deal of loss before you get to the courthouse. And hardship loss. Hardship loss because uh, if you pay people $17.5 for a day of jury service uh, and they can't afford the transportation and they can't afford um, uh, the babysitter, uh, that kind of hardship is going to preclude um, their, their service. Now, uh, one more thing about um, uh, the, the loss, the loss that occurs because of people moving. This is not randomly distributed. Poorer people are more likely to move more frequently. And it's about 15% a year. I think maybe it's gone down during COVID, but uh, it was about 15% a year. So you can see that if you don't update your lists every year, you're going to lose um, a, a fair number of people. So then we move into the courtroom. And assuming that you have a fairly representative group who have shown up at the courthouse, Okay, already a question mark, already a question mark. Um, then uh, you have several threats to representativeness uh, in the courtroom. Now, uh, I'll talk about three of them, uh, three prominent ones. One is the number of pre available peremptory challenges. The second is the failure of a case called Batson versus Kentucky, um, which uh, controlled the jury selection. And the third has to do with jury size. So let's talk about jury selection first, just to set the stage. When you come into a courtroom, you're asked a series of questions to determine whether you can serve on a particular jury. The judge may do the question asking, the judge may do the question asking uh, with the addition of the attorneys participating, Attorneys are good at asking questions and getting answers uh, in the sense that they are not perceived as all powerful and above the way the judges. So we find empirically that they can get more information, but some federal courts in particular tend to leave the questioning solely uh, to, to the judge. Uh, there are two ways in which somebody can be excused from serving on a particular jury. The first way is um, by the judge with an excuse for cause. And an excuse for excuses for cause are unlimited. Okay? That is either if the hardship is too great, you have tickets to go tomorrow to Antarctica, and the judge says, well, you don't have to, and it's non-cancelable, right? 
uh, or you have nobody to stay at home uh, for the period of the trial to take care of your child, hardship, uh, or there's evidence of bias. There's evidence that you cannot be fair. Very hard, very hard to detect whether somebody can be fair by questioning them before the trial. And this, you, I'm sure you've heard, attorneys spend a long time trying to devise questions that will uh, 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 reveal the uh, unfairness um, uh, or potential unfairness of, of a juror. Um, my colleague Mary Rose and I did some uh, research on uh, uh, judges and attorneys here in, uh, and a few other places. Um, and we did little vignettes where we varied uh, whether the juror who had been exposed to something that might be a source of bias, for example, their kids went to school with um, uh, the uh, kids of the victim or another way that where maybe this would be hard to be fair. And we varied whether the juror responded when the judge asked, I can be fair versus I think I can be fair, equivocal or unequivocal. And across these cases, what we learned was that um, attorneys expected and judges uh, did say that they would respond differently to those two situations. That is, they use the equivocal response as a cue. We don't know for sure whether that is a trustworthy cue, but we suspect that it isn't as reliable as the response from the judges. On the other hand, the judges are in a difficult position in terms of trying to decide what kinds of cues you can actually use. And if a juror says, I definitely can be fair, the judge doesn't want to say to the juror, I don't believe you, right? So it is really hard. Equivocal, it's easier. It may be a good cue. We have no data suggesting that it is. The other kind of removal is a removal on peremptory challenge. And there are two, um, uh, the, those tend to be um, uh, limited in number. Um, they tend to be given the same number to each side. Sometimes um, the defense will get uh, more in a criminal case. In civil cases, they get the same number. Um, a limited number, which varies, enormously across states. And just to give you an example, um, there are 20 peremptory challenges in non-capital uh, felony cases for the defense in New Jersey. Now that's an outlier, um, but that is a huge uh, number. You can see how much that can have an effect of molding what, uh, uh, who is on the jury. And almost all states have more than six, uh, six per side. Okay. So that's the background for the, uh, then we get to Batson, um, which was a very important case in 1986, in which um, the court finally said, finally said for the first time that you cannot use a peremptory challenge based on race, 1986. But they had a procedure that they then put in place for how you would determine whether race was a factor in a peremptory challenge, a three-step process. The first step is a prima facie case. In the case of Batson, it turned out, yeah, sure. When they were doing the race challenges, was it explicit? Like, would, would they say, I, I'm going to reject this juror because of their race? Uh, in the earlier days before it was forbidden under Batson, they, 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 they would say, they would sometimes say it, you know, they would sometimes say it. They were not precluded from saying it. There are no norms. There are norm, norms around actually like the, the social norms around an explicit. Well, they, they, they wouldn't have to say it. Let me correct what I just said a little bit. We had done some research where we asked the attorneys 
um, the reason that they excused people and they wrote it on the questionnaire and they would say race. Um, in court, they never had to say race because they would just excuse somebody and they couldn't be challenged because peremptory challenges are without reason. So it never came up that they would have to say um, it was race. It was after, it was in, in Batson where the prosecution excused for the four bl black jurors on the panel um, uh, that the issue came up because the defense then appealed challenging it saying race had infected those use. And finally, the Supreme Court said, you know what? Uh, I think that there are times when race infects, this probably is one, or at least we have to have a procedure for investigating whether race was a factor. And they set up this three-step approach. So again, peremptory means without reason, right? So they didn't have to give a reason. There had to be a prima facie case made by the objector that race was infecting the, 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 ex, the, the challenges. And if the prima facie case was established, then the defense, the, sorry, in this case, then the prosecutor who had stricken the jurors would have to say, well, no, this was my reason for um, uh, excusing these jurors. And attorneys became very skilled at coming up with reasons which were not race-based. Then the third uh, part of the decision back in the judge's hand was to determine whether there was purposeful discrimination by the person exercising the challenge. And it's hard to say whether there's purposeful discrimination in a single case, right? Cases over time in the following Batson developed um, uh, a, a set of standards that said, well, the only reason that you would flunk Batson on the third strand step is if the reason giving was pretextual, okay? Didn't have to be plausible, just had to be, it had to be pretextual. So if you said you took somebody off because he had long hair or because he um, had, uh, uh, wasn't, didn't appear to be paying attention or, uh, or um, he, he lived in a certain area, um, that's all fine. That's all fine. Even if it's totally implausible, as long as it's not pretextual, which means that the judge had to call the attorney a liar um, in order to grant a Batson challenge. Not surprisingly, and Justice Marshall uh, uh, predicted this, Batson did not have any teeth. Um, very few cases um, succeeded in getting um, uh, 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 challenges overturned um, by uh, under Batson. And I wanna show you some data from a study that I did with um, uh, Josh Kaiser um, in Cato Parish uh, in Louisiana. Uh, and this shows you um, the uh, uh, strikes, the peremptory strikes, in um, uh, for by the prosecution on the left side, you can see that um, uh, the prosecution uh, struck 46% of black jurors and 15.3% of non-black jurors. On the next side are the defense strikes. 14.9% um, uh, uh, black jurors and 38.9% um, non-black jurors. The strong racial pattern here, we did research looking at predicting other uh, multivariate predicting based on other uh, characteristics. Um, the difference even gets bigger um, when you control for other ca case characteristics. Okay. Well, what does that mean? And I tried to do this based on uh, last week's um, talk. 
so I made different pictures. Let's see. So this is what you start out with eligible jurors. Okay. After prosecution strikes. And after defense strikes. Uh, so you start out with 35% black eligible jurors and you end up with 31% uh, uh, black eligible uh, jurors. And there are other studies like this that show some degree of balancing out because of apparent racial bias in the use of challenges on both sides, but the prosecution has more uh, pronounced um, distribution than the, uh, than the uh, uh, defense does. So um, here's the problem for the courts. Uh, explanations that the attorneys give for their challenges uh, can be um, absolutely honest, but actually biased. So non-protextual and discriminatory. Uh, this is a study done by uh, Summers and, and Norton. Uh, it involved a case in which the uh, defendant allegedly beat a, a homeowner with a blunt object after being confronted in the middle of a burglary. Um, the victim couldn't identify his attacker, and so the case rested on um, uh, DNA, hair, and uh, footprint analysis. Hair and footprint analysis is not very uh, reliable, by the way. Um, the prosecutor uh, has one peremptory challenge. And he's left with this choice between a journalist who's written uh, articles about police misconduct, you might not want to have them on your jury, and an executive who said he was skeptical of statistics because they're easily manipulated. Okay? Which one are you going to remove? Okay? But there's more to the study. And this was done with attorneys as well as other, uh, uh, other respondents. Okay. They manipulated the race of the prospective juror. And uh, when uh, 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 the juror was, juror was a journalist, if he was black, 79% of the time he was struck. If the juror was an advertising executive, 57% of the time when he was black, he would be struck. So always the black was, juror was more likely to be struck whichever profile he had. And what they creatively did was they also looked at the reasons people gave for having struck one juror versus the other. And when they struck the journalist, they said it was because he wrote these articles about law enforcement. When they struck the executive, it was because he didn't believe in statistics. But the data say it was partly because he was Black, partly because he was Black. These are potentially implicit biases. How do you possibly control them? So. Now states are making, have recognized that um, Batson has failed and they're trying to make some effort. The Supreme Court has not revisited Batson, but states are free to give more rights to um, uh, parties. And so uh, they are trying to bolster Batson. These are all fresh, hot off the press, very new, just coming out online into place, changing um, to the objective observer rather standard, rather than saying, did the attorney, did the attorney intend taking away the purposive kind of requirement, recognizing that unconscious bias can lead to the ex uh, discriminatory exercise of challenges. Um, and then and this one, I, I, Washington state did this and, some other states have, have copied this. I'm a little skeptical of, of this as a good idea, but they've identified presumptively invalid reasons so that when the attorney then gives an explanation for having exercised a challenge, 
and there are about seven of them. I've given you just some examples. Living in a high crime area, prior contact with law enforcement. Uh, in one state, it uh, was a victim of a crime. Okay? That those cannot be used as reasons for having removed a juror. We'll see how those are going to play out. Okay, more radical steps. I'm on the ABA Jury Commission and we are discussing putting a presumptive uh, limit on the number of peremptories. You remember I said there's a maximum in New Jersey of 20 per defendant in non-capital -fel non felony cases. This would put it at um, no more than uh, uh, six. But the most radical by far is, are the judges in Arizona who decided that if peremptories were being used in a discriminatory fashion and we want fair juries, uh, let's cut to the chase and we will eliminate peremptory challenges altogether. They are not constitutionally guaranteed. Removals for cause would be because that would be a lack of bias. You have to be able to have an unbiased jury. But peremptory challenges are not um, protected uh, under the Constitution. And as of January 1st of this year, they abolished peremptory challenges in all cases, criminal and civil. There are ongoing evaluations. I'm involved in one uh, with the National Center for State Courts. Uh, and we uh, are going to assess the effects on judicial behavior uh, and attorney behavior during voir dire, uh, jury selection, jury diversity, and of course, jury verdicts. Uh, and here is where in the question and answer, I hope people will have some ideas about what else we might, uh, might look at. Um, the key question is, what will judges be doing with removals for cause if there are no peremptory challenges um, uh, uh, left. So frequently you will have a case where a juror says, oh, my brother's a police officer, my grandfather was a police officer, um, my brother's a police officer, uh, and oh, the police officers on trial here? Oh, I can completely be fair. And the judge will say, okay, you say you can be fair, you stay on the jury. Because the judge knows that there will be a peremptory challenge to that jury and they will not have to make that determination. The question is, will the judge's behavior change when there is no safety valve through the peremptory challenges. Okay, so um, finally, um, maximizing fairness during the trial, during the jury trial. Well, first of all, you have to have accurate and clear guidance for the jurors. This means that instructions have to be uh, clear and communicate and then they have to be accurate. Um, there's also been a move for anti-bias instructions, specific anti-bias instructions of, to jurors, warning them about implicit bias. And the third thing um, which we talk about is the 12-person jury. You might think that all criminal juries are 12-person juries. They are not. You might remember the Trayvon Martin case. Um, that was a jury of six in Florida. There are several states that have um, uh, six person juries. So optimizing legal guidance. Here we have done studies on the effects of um, giving jurors instruction before the case begins, before the evidence begins, setting the stage, telling them the rules of the game before they play the game, always a good idea. Um, but the general pattern is not to instruct the jury until the very end of the trial, bad idea. Um, structure as well as language with respect to the jury instructions. We did research on the effects 
of um, various kinds of jury instructions. And what we find is that one of the problems that jurors face with jury instructions is not legalese. It's not just words that they are unfamiliar with. What it is, is they are structured badly. So there are pages and pages and pages, 38 pages in the uh, uh, Rittenhouse case, right? And those versions are not put together completely coherently, right? And that causes um, some difficulty. And then the jurors are not told about certain things. My favorite example here is that the jurors were told um, uh, that they, in the Arizona project, they were were eight jurors on a civil jury and six of them had to agree. And at one point the jurors decided that if one of the jurors didn't agree that the plaintiff should get some damages that maybe they could just send him home because he couldn't, um, he shouldn't have participate in the decision on damages. Wrong, unconstitutional in fact. Um, and that kind of information could be given to jurors um, in the course of their instruction. Written copies. Um, the Arizona jurors in our project had each of them a copy of the jury instructions and they consulted them frequently and they read them aloud to each other to make points during the course of the deliberation. There are some jurisdictions in which the jury doesn't even get one copy of the instructions. It's just read to them by the judge. Bad idea. The Rittenhouse jury was given one copy of the instructions. And the first thing they did was to go back and ask the judge for 11 more copies. Okay. Right. Right. Each jury, juror should have a copy of the instructions. Okay, now we get to the sad part. Instructing jurors on bias. We acknowledge that there are implicit biases. Courts have really been disturbed by this kind of a problem they've made some of them elaborate videotapes instructing the jurors on implicit bias to be shown to the jurors as they come in the, to the courtroom. They're really beautiful. I mean, one of them is really nice and, and, and is in fairly wide use. Um, designing instructions to tell the jurors what they should, uh, that they, to alert them. And awareness, of course, and motivation, uh, to be fair, are, are really good uh, first steps. But it's unclear how effective. And there have been three studies done so far, two MTurk online, one with deliberations, and they have not shown effects on, uh, on verdicts. So it's not clear that we can get there with um, instructions, and it's not clear um, how we can get there uh, all together. So finally, um, uh, the uh, last thing is increasing diversity. This is so easy. Increasing diversity on jurors, on juries, uh, is just easily obtained. All the statisticians in the room will recognize this by increasing the jury size. And yet we have had in Florida and a few other places, smaller jurors. We did some research here uh, in uh, Cook County in a civil case, civil court, that, uh, and we looked at actual six member juries and actual 12 member juries because they had both kinds. And we could show, just as statistical theory would predict, um, that diversity uh, with respect to race and ethnicity changed with respect to six person versus 12 person juries. There were only 2% of jurors, juries with 12 jurors who lacked a single black member. But six member juries, 28%. Now the point of this example is 
it's not just race. It's not just ethnicity. It's diversity on all dimensions. And that means viewpoints, and that means life experiences. And uh, so what I advocate and some federal judges have talked about uh, as well um, uh, it, it is if you really want to increase diversity and thereby increase likelihood of representation and a fair cross section, then raising the uh, size of the jury uh, is, the, is the, a, the easiest way to go. Uh, in criminal cases, most places have 12 person juries, but not all. Okay, bottom line, um, the jury's a remarkable institution. Uh, I've told you some sad stories today, but um, that's only because it needs monitoring, nurturing, and support. Uh, and it's, I think, worth the effort in order to maximize jury performance um, and to protect the system's legitimacy. So we still have a lot of work to do. And thank you very much.